Good evening. My name is Sister Catherine Ryan, and I'm privileged to serve as the Executive Director of Maryville Academy, and I'm here this evening on another edition of Children First. And this is a joint uh, effort of our collaboration, Maryville Academy and Cable Access Network Television. We're very grateful for this opportunity to be with you tonight. I'm especially excited tonight with our guest, who is Dick Devine. Uh, Dick may look familiar to many of you because he served as the Cook County State's Attorney for 12 years, uh, has now retired from that, chose to move into private practice after that, and is with the firm of Meckler, Bulger, Tilson, Merrick, and Pearson. I have to tell you a secret. He's also the chair of our board at Maryville Academy now that he's in this private practice, and we're very grateful for Dick's leadership at uh, Maryville as well. So welcome, Dick. Kathy, great to be with you. Uh, let me begin by asking you, Dick, about your own family. Uh, I presume that you have some experience of your own with children, <laughs> since we're talking about children tonight. I, I sure do. We have uh, four children. Uh, they're all in their 40s now, so they're not uh, kids anymore, but they're, they're great, uh, great people. Uh, our oldest went bad and became a lawyer. And uh, then Karen and Tim are uh, in the Chicago Public School System. Karen is the head of the guidance counseling group at uh, Roosevelt, and Tim is the principal at Peyton uh, High School. And our youngest, uh, Pete, is a sergeant uh, in the homicide section on the west side of Chicago with the Chicago Police Department. So, uh, wonderful young people who are serving our society now, and do you have some grandchildren? Yes, we have uh, eight grandchildren, and as uh, my good wife said, it was worth putting up with the kids to get to the grandkids, as they say. So they're, they're very special. We have eight, and they're very special young people. I think our viewers can see that uh, Dick's family is very important to him, his children, his grandchildren. And I think that's an important piece of background because Dick was instrumental in helping change the law for children here in Illinois. And Dick, I'm going to ask you about that. Mm -hmm. As Cook County State's Attorney, you worked for in different areas of public service, but I want to draw your attention uh, at the beginning of the program here to your work for juvenile justice. And perhaps you'd like to tell us about the initiative that you had to bring about balanced and restorative justice in Illinois. Uh, well, uh, I, I will take credit for the initiative, but actually it was, uh, it was Kathy's initiative, and I did it because Kathy told me it was the right thing to do. Uh, very soon after I was elected and Kathy was serving as head of the Juvenile Bureau, uh, she was part of a group that was looking to make the juvenile law a little better. Uh, and after, I think, one of the first couple of meetings with that group, uh, we talked and uh, she sold me on this idea of balanced and restorative justice, which became the hallmark and the focal point for uh, the Juvenile Justice Code in the state of Illinois. Kathy was uh, very active and very instrumental in getting that law passed. and. I think it really is one of the best things that we did, Kathy, because it had the right focus on what we're trying to do and what we were trying to do with the, the juveniles, with the young people. Um, try to uh, build up everybody, the, uh, the victim, uh, the community, and the offender. Uh, and it had a very positive piece to it, which I think kind of energized everybody, certainly in our office, and I think throughout the juvenile justice system in trying to have the right focus on young people. And, and as I noted, it wasn't simply what do we do about the offender, it was, you know, there's a victim out here, what can we do to help the victim get back? And the community has a piece in this too, so. And you saw it every day, but uh, from my standpoint, it really was one of the things I'm proudest of that we did in the state's attorney's office. And uh, looking at the statistics during that period of time, uh, Dick, you're not uh, saying it, so I will, but uh, Dick, uh, brought about a review of all the cases that were being referred to the court and found that thousands of these cases could be handled through uh, uh, different kinds of interventions short of court. And what that did was make it possible, as you just said, Dick, for victims and young people who've committed the offenses and the community to work out dispositions that addressed each of their needs and did not give those young people a juvenile record for the rest of their lives. So I think that was a, another benefit of what you were discussing. I, I think it, th that's true, Kathy, and I think the, the important part of that is for the uh, public to understand that 
you know, prosecutors are often seen as, well, people who just want to throw the book at somebody, and especially in the juvenile area, I think all of us recognize there's an opportunity here. There are some young people, as we both know, that you're never going to get to, but you can't give up. Uh, you have young people, and sometimes it's their environment, sometimes it's different things that have influenced them, uh, and they deserve a chance to turn their lives around. And this program, uh, I think, uh, I think did that, and I think is a, a tribute to your farsightedness and uh, and really the commitment of so many people in our office and offices throughout the state and judges and uh, everybody else that was involved in it. I think you know if we could uh, just mention I there. There's a video. Was it that Blue Island video? Yes. Remember that? Yes. There's a great video that demonstrates how all this works, where some young people, they'd gotten on some uh, construction equipment, hadn't they? Right. And uh, manhandled it. And the construction guy was there, and the children, the young people, and the mediator, and the and construction. And their parents. Oh, and the parents. And the construction guy, and these kids are going back and forth, and he wants a pound of flesh out of each of them. And at one point, one of the kids said something. And the mother, at that point, knew that this young person wasn't telling the truth. And she said, hey, fess up right now. And the young person just kind of burst out with everything they did. And then the construction guy kind of said, well, I don't, you know, we can work this out. You know, it was just a, a marvelous change in the whole dynamic of the thing by bringing everybody together. So right. That conversation took probably three hours. Yeah. Uh, but at the end, uh, those young people had a job with the gentleman whose property yeah. they had brought some damage to. They repaired that damage and they earned some money for the future. Yeah, it's just incredible. It's just yeah. incredible. It is, uh, sometimes as we reflect, it is what we think we used to do when we had a stronger social fabric yeah. and we want to restore those relationships in the community. Yeah, so. exactly. Exactly. It was very personal and it, it got to be one of those face-to-face -face human things that broke down barriers and all the preconceptions and the anger just kind of flowed out of everybody and okay what are we going to do now right. you know, it was great it was great so that was a great contribution that you made dick and and uh, i'd like to just pick up another piece you you've always been concerned about persons who are victimized by crime would you speak about the victim witness unit that you started yes and uh it, it's very uh timely that we talk about it because with all the budget cuts that were being uh, thrown about, uh, some of the victim witness personnel were at issue, as I understand it. Uh, many years ago, when I was first assistant under uh, Rich Daly, I perceived early on that one of the forgotten groups in the criminal justice system are the, are the victims and their families. Uh, so uh, Rich Daly has the primary, uh, deserves the primary credit for doing this, but formed a, we formed a victim witness unit where individuals were assigned to work with the victims and their families so they would know about court dates, they would know where to go, they would know what was going on, and there would be somebody to, to sit with them uh, when the motions were heard and when the trial was taking place. And many of the people, as you know, Kathy, who ended up working in victim witness had been victims themselves. Right. Uh, so they had been through this process, they knew the frustrations of it, and uh, they were they were there uh, really in a very personal sense for uh, these families. And I, I, I watched it uh, many times when you go into court to see a verdict come back or see a big motion heard. The, the, the people really relied on these victim witness uh, personnel and did a, they did a marvelous job and continue to do a marvelous job. Yeah, you just mentioned working for Rich Daly. How many times were you in the state's attorney's office? Uh, I had two main uh, visits to the state's attorney's office. Uh, I started in 1980 when we first met uh, as first assistant state's attorney under uh, uh, Rich Daly and was there for uh, about three years. And then the kids started to get a college age and I had to go make some money again. Uh, and then in 1996 when I ran for the state's attorney's job and was elected and then the 12 years thereafter. So I had about 15 years in the office. So you really started the victim witness unit the first time you were in the office when State Street was Rich Daly, and when you came back as the state's attorney, you really grew that program with the victim witness. Yeah, we did a lot of uh, new things. We we got in, into domestic violence in a special way, uh, and uh, really tried to set up some programs over there that uh, in the domestic violence unit that gave kind of a full range of service to 
the DV victims, and uh, you know one of the transform one of the two major transformations I've seen in the years since I was uh, started in the state's attorney's office was the attitude toward drunk driving mm -hmm. changing so so much, going from oh gee anybody could happen to anybody and to hey this is a real problem, and the same with domestic violence. Both the police and the prosecutors came to see that. Uh, you know, a, a woman, and usually the woman is the victim, uh, had a whole host of things to deal with. I mean, the fact that she wasn't just ready to go and go down and testify and have this husband or boyfriend uh, thrown in the slammer for several years could be caused by, hey, the father of my children, uh, what are we going to do? How are we going to live? He's the one that provides the food to emotional things. Uh, you know, years ago, police and prosecutors, hey, look, if you don't want to prosecute, too bad, live with the guy then. Mm -hmm. But we, we came to see that it's much more than that, and we really tried to beef up uh, the domestic violence uh, side of thing, creating a unit and some of these services with the victim witness personnel. Which has uh, certainly helped a lot of, of uh, women and men, yep. and, their, and the children who live in this uh, violent environment. So oh, absolutely. A, a real service. And uh, Dick, I think as you look at your years in the state's attorney's office, clearly you've just talked about the work you did for uh, reform of our juvenile justice. You've talked about uh, domestic violence, victim mm -hmm. witness. Is there another area that you would highlight uh, that you were involved in during those 12 years? Well, I think those are uh, two uh, major ones. I, I think uh, I'm proud of the fact that I think we hired people who were uh, excellent in terms of their commitment to the office and uh, were committed to making judgments based on the evidence and applying uh, the uh, evidence to the law. Uh, so overall, I, th I think the, the most satisfying thing is the, the ability to work on things that are important to the community and to work with good people uh, and try and help your community be better each day. So there's, there was an overall satisfaction to the job that I think is uh, really unmatched as far as the legal world. You get to use your legal skills and your legal training and you're working on behalf of the community and trying to make the community a better place to live. And speaking of community, I, I think a lot of our viewers might not know that you had advisory community groups. Uh, as state's attorney, would you say a bit about? Yeah, that? we thought, you know, one of the one of the problems with prosecutors is that we're in a system and the cases come to us, and you work through the system, but you don't have that uh, relationship to the community on a day by day basis that that you would like to understand some of the problems that are out there. So we did two things. We had these advisory groups that. Uh, covered a whole host of things. We had a juvenile advisory group. We had one for senior citizens. Uh, we had one for gay lesbians, uh, you know, several uh, uh, African-American and Hispanic, where we could take leaders from the community and have our prosecutors meet with them on a regular basis uh, to talk about uh, issues and problems. And the second thing we did, we created a, a community unit where in uh, four offices we had prosecutors and uh, administrative assistants out in the community where people could just walk up to a storefront and talk about problems or questions or whatever they wanted to do. And we also, I, I should have mentioned this as well, we had a, our community outreach unit where we had individuals assigned to uh, going out into the neighborhoods, going out into the schools and talking about problems. So uh, we, we, tried to, uh, we tried to really uh, cover that as much as we could, make that contact with the community. Well, I, I think uh, you're, you're sharing these stories has prompted a caller, so okay. if you could hear from the caller, please. Good evening. Good evening. I have this one question. It's a, it's a very, um, it's a concern of mine. Why are most judges our former prosecutors? Well, the question is why are uh, most, I, I don't think most of the judges are former prosecutors, but a good number of them are. And I think one of the reasons is that uh, they have been in courtrooms on a regular basis throughout their careers. Over 20 years, many of our prosecutors would have 80 to 100 jury trials, which is more jury trials than many of the law firms have in downtown uh, Chicago. So they know the system. Uh, they have 
become acquainted with the ins and outs of it. They have shown that they can, <coughs> they can do the job. They develop respect. And I think that, by and large, uh, the ex-prosecutors who become judges do an outstanding job. Now, in addition to that, we have a lot of public defenders who mm -hmm. uh, have become judges as well, and they do a, a great job uh, uh, also, and some defense attorneys, uh, private defense attorneys. But it's good to have people coming into the system who understand how it works, and I think they've made a great contribution to our judiciary. Well, thank you. That was a good question. Then. Yeah, I'm oh, sure that absolutely. many people have a have an interest in that. Absolutely. And I, I think as we talk about uh, these areas of community service, Dick, uh, we see that the, the state's attorney's office uh, for Cook County, for all of Cook County, uh, has many ways in which it touches our lives. But I'd like to also ask a little bit about how it touched your life. Um, I think that uh, you personally handled some trials in the office, didn't you? I did. I, you know, I'd been uh, in private practice after being first assistant. When I was first assistant, I prosecuted a couple of cases. and. A, I enjoy being in the courtroom, and B, I thought it was important that uh, uh, that I do it. You know, just A, to get away from the phones for a while <laughs> and the paper, uh, but to show that I was willing to get out there and, uh, uh, and and stand in the courtroom, and I thought it was important enough to do so. Uh, yeah, we had, uh, when I was state's attorney, I tried two cases. One, uh, young man, Arnold Morales, who was a community organizer, who was... Uh, murdered on the southeast side of uh, Chicago. And then uh, after that, I participated in the Brown's Chicken prosecution where the uh, eight uh, people were killed up in uh, Palatine in the Brown's Chicken there. Uh, it, it really is, uh, you know, there's nothing like, I, I think, the, uh, the real, um, the, the tension or the, uh, the system of being involved in a trial and waiting for the jury to come back. I don't, you never get used to that or tired of it. And mm -hmm. the adrenaline is always uh, going a bit. So it, 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 it's the great part of being a lawyer. The trouble in private practice is you get so few trials. That yes. it isn't. But as a prosecutor, uh, you get quite a few. Or 26th and Cal, which is now going to be named after George Layton, one of our great judges. Um, uh, one of the few places left in the in the country where there are trials going on every day. There are fewer and fewer, but uh, we have them in Cook County. And in those situations, you personally were working with the families of the victims. Absolutely. Uh, the Morales family, just wonderful people. Mrs. Morales just passed away, I, uh, I learned. and uh, But they were just terrific people. Uh, the, the great American story, Mr. Morales worked in the steel industry and had wonderful children and then lost Arnold. Uh, but they came to every motion, every status call, uh, and just just wanted to see what was happening and make sure that there was an accountability for the murder of their son. And you see so many thousands and thousands of people having to go through that that I think in, in, a, in a basic sense, it's what, mo it's what motivates a lot of prosecutors to put in the 12, 14 hour days when you're on trial to try and make sure the right thing is done. Uh, they, they, there's never any closure. I mean, I know we use that word. There's, there's never any closure for the families. But if we as a community can't hold the right person accountable for what was done when a loved one is taken away, then we really aren't a community. I think, Dick, one of the very moving um, programs that you, that you sponsored each year was for the victims of, uh, the families of victims who had been murdered. Right. And you, you held that once a year right. in the, the fall, I In think. the fall, yeah. Would you just tell our viewers about that? It's a very moving day. Yeah, well, every year in, uh, in the fall, as Kathy said, at the South Shore Cultural Center, we invited the families of all the uh, murder victims to come together. And they all, many of them had also participated in group sessions that our Victim Witness Program provided. But each year, five, six, seven hundred people mm -hmm. would come and they would bring photos of the loved one they lost. It was like visiting the Vietnam Memorial Wall. You'd see a, a baseball mitt with a ball and a flower next to it or a little poem. Extremely moving. And our victim witness personnel put all this together and did a, a marvelous job. It wasn't a happy occasion, but it was a tremendously moving occasion where uh, families would come together, uh, two or three of them would come up and talk about their experience, 
And I think they really helped each other through this terrible loss that they had gone through. And it certainly affected, certainly affected me and anybody that, that attended uh, uh, the event. It, uh, it, it was just a, a very important emotional part of what the office uh, was and is, Kathy. And now, in addition to that, of course, you're preparing the next generation of lawyers. Uh, you are now teaching at Loyola Law School. I am, yeah. I'm teaching a criminal law course, and I've taught a seminar on the death penalty for three years. And it's, it's nice after 15 years doing all this stuff as a prosecutor, and then you sit back and read some books and say, oh, that's, that's where that rule came from. You know? <laughs> Should have read that earlier. Uh, no, I, but it, it, it is nice to be with the young people and to be able to talk to them about the theories we see in the law books, but then also talk to them about some of the practical things that go on in the criminal justice system. And I try and step back from my experience as a prosecutor, and ideally you would like them not to know what any of your views were, but given my background, I think they kind of guess many of my views. But I try and stay away from, from, from that kind of thing and help them look at it from all sides. And my major message to them is, I don't care whether you're a prosecutor, defense lawyer, whatever, but be a good lawyer about it. And whatever your involvement, don't just rely on some rhetoric. Uh, know how to prepare your case and argue your case. So it's fun to be with the young people. Do you notice anything different about this generation of future lawyers from uh, past generations? You know what, I, and I, I'm an old coot, so they probably just think I'm, that's what I am. But uh, what, what you do notice, or I notice compared to the time I was in law school, is I think with the texting and everything, a lot of young people tend to write in half sentences yes. <laughs> or <laughs> fragments. And uh, I had one student, I was assigned an essay on something, and she came up and asked me, uh, do I have to use full sentences? I said, yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. So, <laughs> so that's one thing I noticed. <laughs> but they're good. They're good people. And by a number of them are great writers, but well, there are a few. That's good. And Dick, one, one last question here. Yeah. Uh, you have another dream that lawyers have, you have accomplished, to argue in front of the United States Supreme Court. Yeah. It uh, we have just a, a moment to talk about Yeah, I, I just, it, it is a tremendous honor to do it, a tremendous experience, and I will just say I, I got the chance to do it twice as a prosecutor. And the most interesting thing is you have this vision of the Supreme Court with like an arena-like setting, thousands of people around. It's actually a very intimate setting when you're doing the argument, and uh, I, I, I thought it was uh, really one of the highlights of my uh, legal career to be able to do it. A great experience. Great experience. Well, I, uh, I think that as we're closing up this program, you can see that the reason we invited Dick to come today is because of his experience in public service and his understanding of the contribution of the legal profession and his real heart for children, for victims of domestic violence, and for others who have suffered harm. So thank you, Dick, for joining us tonight on the program. Thanks, Kathy. And it was wonderful to be with you. And thank each of you for being with us in the program tonight.